video 7 of chapter 3. We're going to finally end with video 7 here, and we're going to tie up some loose ends and talk about uh, kind of a variety of things. So first off, um, sometimes you're going to be given some computer output. You may not be actually given the data so that you can calculate the regression line with your calculator. But let's say that somebody somewhere uh, had some computer software, not your calculator, something fancy that costs hundreds of dollars, and they put all the data into their computer and they ran a regression analysis. And so the context of this problem is uh, that some apartments charge rent based on a person's income. So let's call the person's income the explanatory variable, and we're using it to try to maybe predict how much rent would be for that particular person. Now, sometimes, and this isn't going to happen too terribly often here, but in this specific instance, what they have written right here is basically the LSRL. Now, what we would also put in here is maybe a little hat on the cost to say that this would represent the predicted cost based on the actual income value here. So in this case, they gave us the regression line, and we know what the y-intercept and the slope are. But sometimes, and I would say oftentimes, this isn't going to be listed up here. And then you're going to have to look down here at all the rest of this stuff and try to figure out, well, where and how do I know um, what the slope and the y-intercept values are? So there's always going to be something called a constant. And the constant is the constant of your regression line. So kind of pun intended, I guess. Uh, whatever number you see next to constant, and it's typically listed under something that'll say coefficient or maybe abbreviated coefficient, this is the y-intercept. Now, the other thing that's listed with constant, in this case income, this is in context to the problem. And whatever number is next to it under the coefficient heading, this will always be the slope. So the constant is always the y-intercept. Whatever the context of the problem is, in this case, this is our explanatory variable, uh, the number next to it is the slope value. Now, down below, we've got uh, r hyphen sq. This is r squared. And then there's something else that'll maybe say r squared, but then adj for adjusted. Um, I don't really personally know what the adjusted r squared, what is being adjusted for. Uh, so just know that you're just going to pick the thing that says r squared. All right. So we've got the y-intercept. we got the slope. Here's where we find r squared. For the people specifically going to take the AP exam, uh, sometimes this will be listed here. And this represents the standard deviation of the residuals. This isn't something that we've discussed this chapter. Um, but I'm just going to throw this out here. I'm not going to explain what this represents per se, but all of the residuals that we got in the last video that we made a residual plot with, you could calculate the standard deviation of all of those residuals, and that would be this particular number that they're going to call S. And for those taking the AP exam, we'll talk more in depth later on as we prepare for the AP exam that this may or may not really be referenced on the AP exam. Now, all the other stuff, this SE coefficient, uh, T and P, those are all going to be things we'll discuss next semester. So don't worry too much about those. Just kind of cross them out of your mind for now. So again, y-intercept and slope, and then our r-square number. These will be the main three things that we're going to need to reference. All right, so that was computer output. The next thing on our list to discuss was this idea of extrapolation. So let's say I've got some data, and I've got data from 2005 to 2008 of the Northern Rock share prices on the opening day. All right, so here's data for all of these particular years from 2005 all the way up to, but I stopped at 2007. Okay, and so here's all those prices. So this is really a scatter plot, but what they did is they just connected this and made this a line plot. But just imagine there are all these little dots in here, all right? And this red line represents the regression line. And I can tell, based on this, that the price is, you know, on average moving up and to the right. And so if I said, hey, if it's currently um, this date right here, could you give me how much the stock price is going to be in the future? 
And if your data only goes up to this date, then how would you be able to give me the price for the date in the future? And you could say, well, I've got a regression line here. Couldn't I plug this value in, this time in for X, and it would give me a predicted value, and that predicted value would be right here on my LSRL? And then from there, I could go over to my y-axis, and I could predict whatever that particular price is. Could you do that? And yeah, sure, you could do that. But there's some caution in that. And that idea is called extrapolation. And extrapolation is when you're using a regression model, an LSRL, to make a prediction that's outside of the domain of your explanatory variable. Now, what I mean by that is if you remember back in your Algebra 1 days, domain and range. Domain was all the possible X values that you could use, and range was all the possible Y values that you could get from those X values. Now, using our specific data set here, um, the domain of our data is all the way from here up to, we have data, and then it ends right here you can make predictions safely using your regression line for these particular dates. This is the domain of your data. Now, the value that I had out here, it's outside of the domain of our data. So you could make a prediction for this particular value, but you have no idea what's going to happen to that stock price. Maybe around this date right here, maybe something terrible happens. Uh, maybe the CEO dies or the CEO is arrested for uh, insider trading. And then all of a sudden the stock price just tumbles. And then you think the price is going to be way up here when in fact it's going to be way down here. You don't know what's going to happen. So I say here, think of your data like the present. The data that you have is the data that you know. And it's the data that you can make reliable predictions with. So you ideally should not try to predict the past or the future based on the data that you have. So here's another example showing you more visually. So let's say my minimum X value, my minimum domain value, is somewhere around 10 on this X axis, and my maximum X value is a little bit above 40. All right, consider this, this is, and here's my scatter plot in here, and here's the line of best fit for this data. I could safely make predictions between 10 and a little bit more than 40. But if I wanted to make predictions for values less than 10 or more than this 42-ish, let's say, then that's extrapolation. And that's where you don't know exactly what's going to happen uh, for larger values of X or for smaller values of X. Now, whenever we have our values in our domain, this is interpolation just like we could have extrapolation on either end here. So what do I do if I'm asked to make an extrapolated prediction from a regression model? Well, there's two things you can do here. Number one, go ahead and make the prediction. But you probably want to discuss about the potential pitfalls of making such a prediction, aka you may be way, way off with your prediction. Number two, you could just say, I'm not going to make the prediction because this is an extrapolated prediction value. But you can follow up with an explanation of why you're not going to make the prediction. And you would want to say something along the lines of that your regression model can safely make predictions really between your minimum and maximum values that you have for your data set. Okay? You don't want to be making predictions for uh, values of x that are smaller than your min or bigger than your max. So really one of these two would be an appropriate uh, decision to make if you were asked to make an extrapolated prediction. The last part I want to discuss is this idea of causation. Now, I found this awesome website, and the website is listed down here, so I'm citing you author, Tyler Vegan, tylervegan.com. And what he has done, he has found data sets that are highly correlated with each other. And so here's an example on his website. He's got total revenue generated by arcades, correlates with computer science doctorates awarded in the United States. And look at the correlation value here. The correlation is 0.985. That is an extremely strong correlation. And if we look at the data that he has from between 2000 and 2009, we can see that those data points are really close together, which is why we have such a high correlation. 
You might go, well, where did he find such data? Well, he's so nice that he tells us the two places where he found these two data sets. The U.S. Census Bureau apparently records total revenue generated by arcades, and the National Science Foundation records the number of computer science doctorates awarded in the United States. So this is actual data here. But we have a really high correlation. So, man, that seems kind of odd. Let me show you another example here. U.S. crude oil imports specifically from Norway, correlating with drivers killed in collisions with railway trains. Correlation, 0.95. Very strong correlation here. And again, you can go look up the data yourself because he's already done it, but if you want to double check them, you can. Now, does that mean, does that mean that the more we import crude oil from Norway, the better the chance that a person would be killed by a train? That seems so weird, doesn't it? Does it not seem weird to you guys? So does that mean that oil from Norway um, is really bad oil, and if you live near railroad tracks, that um, your car is going to stall because of this Norwegian oil, and it's going to cause you more than likely to have a higher chance of being hit by a train? I mean, that doesn't make sense. It shouldn't, I hope. But I want to show you now a third example here, and this is not from the same website. Uh, but there was a study that was actually done, and it showed that as violent crime increased or decreased throughout the year, so this is January, February, blah, 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 October, November, December, that it was strongly correlated with ice cream sales. How weird. Now, notice ice cream sales tend to peak in the summer months when it's hotter, and they continue to drop when it's the winter months, right? But violent crime also follows that same pattern. There's not as much violent crime in the winter months, and there's much more violent crime happening in the summer months. So does that mean that uh, ice cream sales and violent crimes are really closely related? Or does, does the mob who commits violent crimes, are they in charge of ice cream sales? This seems so weird. Is this the Illuminati? This might be Illuminati happening, guys. I don't, I don't know. Now, there's this concept called the lurking variable, and it's something we will discuss much more so in depth next chapter. But a lurking variable is a variable that impacts the relationship between the explanatory and the response variable. But we don't discuss it. It's kind of lurking in the background. Okay, It's kind of like the Wizard of Oz. He's there, but you don't really know he's there. and He's pulling the strings here. He's being the puppet master. Now, any good researcher will attempt to reduce the number of and effects of lurking variables by running a controlled experiment. So what I'm getting at here is there really isn't a connection, a direct connection, between violent crime and ice cream sales. There is a lurking variable at play that is really present in both violent crime and it's present in ice cream sales. And that really, and we discussed it there, uh, earlier with the time of the year. We noticed that in the summer times, both ice cream sales and violent crimes increase. And in winter months, well, we didn't see as much ice cream sales and much violent crime. But it's more that it's the temperature, which is related to the time of the year that that's happening, that's really causing those two things. So the natural thing to think of, and I think this way is going to make more sense here, that when it gets hotter, people are going to want to eat ice cream more to be cool. So hopefully that makes sense. But the one thing that I know people in the past have a hard time understanding is, well, how does, it, how does the fact that it's hot outside affect violent crimes? And let me just say um, that people who typically commit violent crimes probably live in situations where they probably don't have air conditioning in their homes. And if they don't have air conditioning in their homes, then they're probably outside. And they're probably going to be outside with other people that are in the same living conditions that they're in. And if they don't have air conditioning, then maybe they want air conditioning. And to get air conditioning, that costs money. And to get money, they might have to commit some violent crimes. Now, I'm not stereotyping or generalizing that uh, to a particular uh, set of people, but in general, that's kind of what happens. And so it's the heat that causes people to go outside. When people go outside, 
they can get into arguments and they can come up with crazy cockamamie schemes for how do we make more money so that we can get air conditioning. So really, it's heat that affects both of these things. And so whenever we look at these two things together, we say, man, there is a correlation between these two things. Uh, increasing ice cream sales is causing people to be more violent. But that's not the truth. It's really this lurking variable that's causing an increase and a decrease in these two things. So the idea here is correlation does not imply causation. Just because we see a correlation between two things doesn't mean that one thing is causing the other thing to increase or decrease. Okay, That causation could be from a lurking variable. So what I want you guys to do to end video seven here is I went back to the first example I showed you with total revenue generated by arcades correlating with the number of computer science doctorates awarded in the U.S. And we saw that correlation was 0.985. That is a very strong correlation. Now I want you to consider, could there be a lurking variable that causes these two variables of interest to kind of ebb and flow with each other, that an increase in one causes an increase in the other? So I'm just going to rack your guys' brains. Can you come up with a third variable that would cause an increase or decrease in either one of those two variables. And that'll be something we'll discuss the next day in class. And that is all for video seven. And that is all for chapter three.